afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to see uh, lots of people here this afternoon for this webinar. Uh, I'm just going to give it a minute or two. We've got a few more people coming in. Um, but my name is Claire Sandbridge, for those of you that haven't met me before. Uh, and I'm Conservation Officer at Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust. Uh, hopefully um, today we'll get a bit of respite from this very autumnal weather that we're, uh, that we're uh, experiencing at the moment uh, and go through some more um, sunny, bright, warm um, images of butterflies, um, which hopefully will transport us to somewhere um, just a little bit uh, more um, welcoming uh, than the current weather, um, certainly if you were a butterfly. So um, just seeing how many we've got at the moment, we're up to 31 uh, and it's a minute past. So I'm just going to give it a, a little bit of time um, just to make sure um, we've got everybody here today. Um, so, yeah, really, um, it's really good to see so many people um, and I hope you really enjoy the session. I hope you enjoy um, hearing a bit more about the wider project uh, and I hope you're all excited to hear a little bit about butterflies. Some of it might be new to you, um, some of it may be stuff that you do know already, um, but it's always good to, to know um, that you are yeah, correcting some of your IDs. If you think, actually, I already know that one, that's never a bad thing. OK, I'm just going to share my screen uh, and then we will get on uh, and start today's presentation. OK. So hopefully you can see my screen and um, just uh, this is the, the welcome. Um, so anybody who's joined late, I'm Claire Sandbridge from Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust. Uh, and this is the Charmed Forest Species Identification and Recording session. Uh, and it's the second session in our series uh, on butterflies. And if I can make it move on, let's see if we can get this to work. There we go. OK, so um, most of you, I think, are on mute. Uh, if you're not, um, if you don't mind, please putting yourself on mute to minimise any background noise while we're going through. We are recording the session um, so that it can be um, listened to um, afterwards by anyone who wasn't able to make it today. Or if you wanted to look, watch back um, for any bits, um, then you're obviously you're welcome to do that. And we will send around the link afterwards. Uh, most of you have your cameras off, which is absolutely fine, not a problem at all. Um, you're welcome to have them on or off. Sometimes it can help if you're having any issues with the, um, the streaming on your broadband, and um, sometimes having the video off will help. There will be time for question and answers at the end. Um, if you would like to pop them in the chat box, um, I can't necessarily see the chat box straight away as we're going through this. Um, so um, if you don't get a, an answer straight away, I will have a look through at the end of the session. Um, hoping to be done by two o'clock. Um, so hopefully if we can keep to time, um, that's the plan for the session. So just to have a little note about the aims of the session today, uh, we're going to start with just a reminder about the Landscape Partnership Scheme that this project is a part of. We're going to remind um, everybody about the Species Identification and Recording Project, why it's set up and what the objectives are. I'd like to introduce indicator species to you. Um, this is a concept that I think will help us when we are thinking about why we do recording uh, butterflies and other animals. Then we'll move on to the introduction to some common butterflies. Uh, I picked 12 today. Um, there are lots that we could go through. Um, I don't want to overload everybody, but we picked some common ones to get you started, or perhaps restarted on your wildlife identification and recording journey. At the end, We'll talk about some links to resources that are available and also point you in the direction of the free spotter sheet that you can download that we've created specifically for this project. And we'll finish off with a question and answer session. So in terms of the introduction to the scheme, for those of you that made it to our session about three weeks ago on common uh, wildflowers, uh, we heard from the scheme manager, Julie Attard. Uh, and I'm not going to replay the whole video because I think some of you may have already um, seen this um, before. Um, and um, I, so I, I will send around the link to it afterwards. Um, it's a great introduction to the whole scheme. Julie talks about the Charmed Forest. Those of you that know it know how amazing it is as a landscape. Um, and the identification and recording project that this that webinar is part of is just part of a larger scheme. And there's loads of different opportunities to get involved. So if you didn't see it last time, and I know we had some sound issues um, as well, so do go back. It's on YouTube and you can access it via the link there. And I will send this link around afterwards. 
So we're part of a bigger scheme, but today what we're hoping for is um, an introduction to um, common butterflies as part of identification and recording. So why do, why do we identificate, uh, identify and record species uh, and why in the Charwood Forest? Well, um, for those of you that know it, as I've just said, it's, it's a special place. Um, and in order to help us manage and check the health of the habitats and the species that are in the Charwood Forest, what we need to do is have a better understanding of what's going on. And we do that by recording the species that are there. And we can record them and look at them on a year on year basis. Uh, and actually, if we take a step back, and look over several years, it helps to give us an understanding of any trends, the direction that things might be moving in. Um, uh, so we can really see what's going on. If we're managing a habitat, are we getting it right? Are we moving towards the objectives that we want? Um, or is there something that we could change um, to make it better? So it helps us care for the forest. Uh, and it's a great way for um, anybody else to get involved in caring for the forest. Hopefully it's a fun way um, I can't think of anything better personally than being out and about on a nice day, um, just surrounded by nature uh, and really looking at either a, a particular species or group of species, just being out. And sometimes you get the opportunity to be out with like minded people, um, have a great social time uh, and understand a little bit more about what's around you and contribute um, to what we're doing in the Charwood Forest. So currently um, there's nearly 14,000 species records we have um, for the Charmwood Forest and a small committed group of volunteers. What we hope as a result of this project uh, is that both of those could increase uh, and we hope that we may be able to set up either one or more new recording groups um, depending on what people are really interested in, where they feel their skills might best lie. Um, so we're going to develop this. Uh, this is the first year, it has been slightly delayed due to Covid but we'll be developing the project and it's running for the next three or four years. Um, so there's going to be loads of opportunity to get involved. Today's webinar, as I said at the start, is number two in the series. We're going to hopefully um, do these monthly uh, and look at different species or look in detail at more species as we go along. Um, hopefully next year as well, we might have some outdoor sessions that you can attend so we can really be out in the field, which is where I guess we all want to be, um, just can't necessarily manage it at the moment. But being on Zoom here is a great opportunity to spend some time um, looking at some species, um, getting that introduction, um, so that when you go out in the field, you're better prepared. So as I said at the start, I wanted to introduce this concept of indicator species. And this is a definition from Lawton and Gaston, um, and it, maybe it's a little bit wordy, but let me just read it out. So an indicator species is a species or group of species that reflect the biotic, or abiotic state of an environment. Reveal evidence for or the impacts of environmental change or indicate the diversity of other species, taxa or entire communities within an area. Now that is a little bit of a wordy, um, a wordy statement there so let me see if I can break it down. So an indicator species is a species or group of species. So if we think about butterflies, um, so it could be one particular butterfly it could be all butterflies, if we're thinking about a group of species, or we might think about just woodland butterflies, perhaps. So um, we can be in detail about one species, or it could be a group of species grouped in whatever way we want it to be. But that, in, that kind of reflects, it indicates either the biotic, which is living, or the abiotic, non-living, state of the environment. So we've got a species that reflects what's going on from a living perspective, so maybe to do with predation or pollination, or it might be reflecting what's going on in the abiotic state, so that might be reflective of temperature or rainfall. The other thing it might do is reveal evidence for or the impact of environmental change, so if we look at these indicator species over time we can see if these species are changing that uh, might indicate that the environment too is changing. And it also might indicate the diversity of other species. So we can use one species perhaps as a proxy for other species or habitats or whole communities, which is what ecology is all about, this kind of idea of, of community. So indicator species uh, are really important. We can't possibly get out, everybody record absolutely everything. So sometimes we look at particular species um, which will help to indicate what is going on maybe to do with pollution, um, perhaps a change in climate, changes in habitat management, fragmentation, so breaking up of habitat uh, and connectivity or lack of connections between different habitats. 
So what about butterflies? Well, butterflies are a brilliant indicator species. You may have um, already jumped ahead uh, and worked that out given the theme of today's webinar. So butterflies occur in all the main terrestrial habitat types in the UK. Um, and so they've got potential to act as indicators for a wide range of species and habitats. And they're good indicators. Um, hopefully they're quite easy to recognize. Um, maybe we'll find out a bit more about that as this webinar goes on. Butterflies have relatively short life cycles, which means they react quickly to environmental changes. So if there's something good or bad going on, you can see it quite rapidly um, in changing butterfly populations. Some of them have limited dispersal ability, so they're quite localised, so they can help you understand or indicate what's going on locally. Um, often they have a specific food plant that the larvae or caterpillar um, are specialists for. Um, so this can help you understand if that particular species um, is in a particular habitat. They also have close reliance on the weather and the climate. As I mentioned, for those of you that were there um, on the webinar first thing, um, the weather at the moment isn't brilliant. It's perhaps a little unseasonal, a bit windy and a bit chilly. Um, and a lot of butterflies find that that's not great. So butterflies are closely reliant on um, the right weather conditions, um, which we know is linked to the overall climate. And what the graphs, hopefully you can see on the right hand side of the screen, um, you can see whether species are increasing or decreasing over time. And you can also see um, whether species are emerging earlier or later. And so this is phenology, the second phrase um, that is at the bottom of the screen there. Okay. Um, it did tell me that my internet connection was unstable, so I apologise if it's broken up at all, but hopefully um, you can all hear me okay. So moving on a little bit to the life cycle of the butterfly. Um, before we talk about um, identifying them, I just um, thought it would be um, just good to recap um, on the different terminology you might hear when we're talking about butterflies, because most of may be talking about the adult butterfly or imago um, uh, when we're talking about identification. But there are also different stages from egg or ovum through to the caterpillar or the larva. Then they form a chrysalis or a pupa and then you get to the adult. So I have some pictures here of butterfly egg, this is in the white family. Uh, and then we're going to caterpillar or larva. The chrysalis or the pupa. And then finally the adult butterfly or the imago. And you may associate butterflies very much a bit like the adult butterfly here is on the last photo, um, of being associated very strongly with flowers. And that's great. Flowers are a real key nectar source for the adult. But what we mustn't forget is that we need to provide for all the different life stages of the butterfly. So a lot of butterflies, as we'll see, might lay their eggs on grasses. Um, some might be in hedgerows or trees, live most of their life in the more woody vegetation. And certainly caterpillars and pupa need space at different times of the year and um, to make sure that they complete each stage of their development. So it's really important for butterfly conservation that we're thinking across a range of habitats and a range of time frames. So a little bit more on the life cycle. Uh, this is only a very basic level. Uh, I'm trying to make this as very much an introductory um, talk today. Over the next um, few years, as we go through, butterflies are one of the species we will be developing, hopefully, to give you a more detailed look. So we may end up focusing on some of these other li um, life cycle stages in more detail as we go through. But today, just wanted to say that you start off with the egg, around a millimetre high on the, on the hole, laid on or near a suitable host plant. And this is the host for the larvae, or caterpillar. As it emerges from the ed egg, um, it has a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And the caterpillar actually goes through several stages where it feeds and sheds its skin. And these are called instars. So actually, the caterpillar can change quite a lot um, between it emerging from the egg and when it starts to develop into the chrysalis. So when we're talking about identification of caterpillars, that becomes an even more tricky topic than the one we're going to talk about today, which is identifying adult butterflies. The chrysalis is where the body and the appendages are completely broken down. An amazing process, um, adult wings, eyes, proboscis, and that develop. And then finally, the adult emerges. It has small floppy wings to start with, but it pumps fluid through the wing veins and to harden them before it flies. And different species will go through all of these different processes at different times of the year. 
So if you look at the chart at the bottom of the screen there, uh, and all of these are available at Butterfly Conservation's website, um, you can see for this species, the egg laying happens around the July, August, September mark. The caterpillar stage is from September all the way through the winter um, into the next spring, where it becomes a chrysalis, and then the adult emerges in the summer to mate, lay eggs, and the life cycle continues. And this particular species does this once every year. What we will talk about um, as we go through is there are some species that there is more than once in a year. They manage to get two life cycles through. This particular species overwinters as a caterpillar. Um, so the caterpillar is, the, is the, the stage that has to survive the slightly harsher weather, um, but that is different for different species. And so we'll, we'll see where we go um, as we look at the different species today. So we're going to look at some common butterflies. Hopefully everybody is still with me and my internet problems um, seem to have um, calmed down. So hopefully everything is okay. When we're talking about the common butterflies today, we're going through 12 of them, but I did just want to give you a picture of butterflies in general. There are 59 species in the UK and we're picking 12 today. 57 are resident and two are migrant. Um, and butterfly migration is something that I can't get my head around, how something so seemingly small and delicate can migrate over such a distance. Five species on the, the, the flip side of the coin have become extinct over the last 150 years. Um, so things aren't brilliant for all butterflies. Um, the plus side is that one of those species has been successfully reintroduced, the large blue. I'm not going to talk in detail about that one today. Um, but there are some amazing um, YouTube webinars if you're interested in hearing about the large blue butterfly and how it's been reintroduced uh, and just the, the amazing life cycle that it goes through. Um, there's one on the Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust YouTube channel. Again, I can send down the link if you're interested um, from our very own Head of Conservation, John Clarkson. And the latest state of the UK's butterfly report in 2015 um, reported that 76 species have either declined in abundance, occurrence, or both over the last 40 years. So it's not a great picture. However, um, there are some species that at the moment are relatively stable in their populations, um, but there's so much that we can do to help them. And as I said before, um, the changes in butterfly populations can often indicate other changes um, in the environment uh, and in the habitat as well. So common butterflies today, let's crack on, uh, and it's no, um, Coincidence that the photograph that I've chosen for this uh, cover page here is the first species that we're going to look at. So this one is a very striking butterfly um, called the Red Admiral. Uh, and it does have red on it, which is very helpful. Not all of our wildlife um, is, is named in exactly the way you might think. But it's a very distinctive, very dark black butterfly. And it has red bands and white spots. Um, some people say that um, the white is a bit like the admiral's kind of stripes, the admiral's epaulets on the shoulders there. Um, so that might be one way to remember the red admiral butterfly. It is quite a large butterfly, um, one of the largest, uh, and its flight time generally is around May to November. Now, it's just important to remember at this stage, if I'm giving some kind of general times in terms of um, months of the year, um, these are general times. Um, if you see something a bit earlier or later, don't be too surprised. Um, there is a lot of flexibility in these. But in general, for the red apple, we're looking at kind of late spring uh, and actually then on through the year. It's quite happy in widespread habitats. Um, the adults uh, nectar on a variety of, kind of native and introduced shrubs. So it's one you might see if you have the, the butterfly bush or the buddleia, um, but blackthorn, bramble, thistles, etc. Now, the next three species that I'm going to talk about all have a larval food plant in common. And the most important of these is common nettle, stinging nettle. Uh, if it's anything like um, where I live, where you are at the moment, the stinging nettle is a bit of a bit of a pain when you're literally when you're going for a walk. Um, they've grown really well uh, and then potentially fallen over onto the path uh, and they're always catching you on the leg or on the arm. Um, so while stinging nettle may not always be welcome from a walking perspective, um, stinging nettle is a really important plant for butterflies. Uh, and the, the first three on this um, slideshow today um, all have their larval food plant as a stinging nettle. So it just highlights how important it is to have a range of plants, not just one plant or two plants, um, not just have the ones we think are really showy or the real big flowering plants. 
um, but even ones that you might think are a bit of a pain are just as important. The thing about the Red Admiral is the population is actually mostly migrants from Central Europe. Um, so this butterfly can fly across the channel, which is just amazing. Um, some, however, are overwintering as adults now in, the, in this country, mostly in the south. Um, so um, it, it is known to be a native breeding, not just a migrant species. So that's the Red Admiral butterfly. Another one um, of a similar size, perhaps even slightly larger, is the peacock butterfly. Uh, and this is possibly one of the most striking and hopefully one of the most easy to identify, I think. You really can't mistake the bright eye spots, um, which I guess it gets its name from the peacock bird. Um, you can see them on the wings here. So it's this red orange colour on the top of the upper wings um, and these eye spots. Um, we think they've evolved to startle or confuse predators. And now one of the um, books I was reading about, about butterflies and, and why they might have these colourings, um, just pointed out that sometimes um, looking at the butterfly the way we would normally look at it from a human perspective um, doesn't give us the true picture. And for the peacock, actually, if you look at it from a different angle, um, hopefully you can see the upside down version and um, the blue spots are even more like eyes and the body of the butterfly actually does it look like a beak so if the butterfly is there flapping its wings slightly um, any predator that comes up and thinks oh I might have a little snack um, is going to be really quite confused and startled um, by the eyes and potentially even the beak maybe even confused to thinking this is not a butterfly at all this is not a food this is another bird I should stay away so the peacock flight time, uh, it is seen throughout the year. The majority emerge fairly early, March, April time. And it's one of the butterflies that has a second generation uh, that emerges at the end of July. It's a wide ranging butterfly and quite a strong flyer. So if you see you're out and about, in you know, most habitats, gardens, parks, if you see quite a strong flying dark butterfly, um, chances are you might have a peacock there. Uh, and this is another chance to talk about uh, a concept and I find really helpful, um, specifically for butterflies, but it can be applied to other species as well. Uh, and that is about this idea that you can look at the general impression, size and shape of the species to help you identify what it is. Now, the general impression, size and shape might be a term you're familiar with or jizz um, in the birding world. I think it originated actually from people trying to identify planes up in the sky, um, kind of post-war um, phrase. Um, it's been taken on by the birding community. But what I take it to mean, and I find it helpful, is taking that step back sometimes. If you're not sure what a species is, have a think about the general impression of it, the size and shape, and where are you? What sort of habitat are you in? What time of year is it? Uh, and that can help give you a clue. But if you can't get the butterfly to settle so you can take a really good look at it uh, and it's just typical that every time you want to identify a butterfly it decides to fly off but if you've got an idea of the general impression and the size and the shape of the butterfly it can help you um, to maybe narrow down so you've got a strong flying dark butterfly um, and actually is that likely to be a peacock are you in the right sort of habitat is it the right sort of time of year what you might notice from the middle picture as well, and it was very similar on the Red Admiral, is the butterfly has a very dark um, camouflaged underwing. Uh, and this is common to butterflies that do overwinter as adults or hibernate as adults. Um, you might find it in a shed or in a kind of tree hole. Uh, and it's important for it to be camouflaged um, so that when it's hibernating over winter, it closes up the wings uh, and it's almost invisible to the naked eye and hopefully certainly invisible to many predators. So that gives you a hint if the underside of the butterfly is very heavily camouflaged as to when it might overwinter, uh, sorry, what stage it might overwinter at. So as I said, like the, um, the red admiral, the larval food plant, so that the food plant for the caterpillar is common nettle. Uh, and the photo on the right here shows the jet black spiky caterpillars of the uh, peacock butterfly. They spin a communal web um, for extra safety. Um, but we're not going to um, talk in detail about caterpillars today. As I insinuated at the start, um, caterpillars are a really tricky um, topic. Um, there's a whole book about the different life stages of um, caterpillars. Um, and there's other books that just literally are solely um, dedicated to the, the different caterpillars uh, and the different colours that you might see and the different stages as the caterpillar goes through its different instars or stages. Um, but if you see a stinging nettle with a big cluster of very jet black spiky caterpillars, 
um, perhaps with a communal web spun around them, um, you may well be looking at a cluster of peacock caterpillars. So the peacock butterfly, bright eye spots, it's that coloration, it's that trying to make warm predators when it's an adult on the wing to stay away. Uh, and underneath, it's got this camouflage um, that means it's then trying to say, actually, I'm going to hide away uh, and hide from predators. So it's almost got two different strategies as to how it might avoid being eaten as it goes through its life cycle. So another one, um, which also has this underwing, this kind of cryptic um, coloration uh, underneath is the small tortoise shell. This one is a little bit smaller than the first two butterflies. So if you're looking at that general impression and size and shape, the small tortoise shell is, as its name suggests, a bit smaller. It's a lovely orange butterfly. It's got this tortoise shell patterning uh, and you can't quite see it perhaps from this photo, but the blue on it, and uh, you do get these little blue beads around the edge of the wing. It's quite a striking butterfly. It's around and about most of the year. Uh, typically it has two broods uh, and overwinters as an adult. As I said, it's got those camouflaged underwings, so that's a clue and um, can help um, indicate that that's, that's how it um, fulfills its kind of life strategy, overwintering as an adult. And then it's the adults are ready to get going straight away the next spring um, with their mating and egg laying. It's widespread, it's common in gardens. Hopefully it's one you might recognise, you might have seen around. And like the red admiral and the peacock, the larval food plant is the common nettle. So another tick to have some stinging nettles, have a slightly messy bit in your garden. Um, don't worry too much about having it all neat and tidy. You've got a patch at the bottom that's you know, near the compost heap, a bit overgrown and there's a few nettles in there. Um, you can chalk that up to a win for wildlife gardening uh, and maybe sit back and enjoy a cup of tea instead of thinking that you have to tackle tidying it up. Leave it, leave it over winter as well. Uh, and the butterflies and other insects uh, will thank you for it. So we're moving away from some of the um, sort of larger butterflies to something slightly smaller. This one at first glance might look a bit similar. It's another sort of smallish orangish butterfly in the general impression if you spot a gatekeeper. Um, so the tortoise shell, it's got that tortoise shell patterning. The gatekeeper is one of these that's got um, little spots on it. Uh, um, it's got these two little white dots on the following. Um, it's got a brown around the edge, um, orange brown wings. Uh, and the gatekeeper name, or also known as hedge brown, gives you a little bit of a clue as the sort of place you might find the gatekeeper. It's one of the brown butterflies, uh, and you're probably more likely to see that out in the open countryside. Uh, hedgerows, gateways, field edges, it's quite a territorial little butterfly. Um, and so if anything gets too close, it will be fluttering around almost as if it's trying to chase you off. Um, this particular butterfly, this particular image, actually shows a male. And if you can see on the wings, um, just sort of next to the spots, there are two dark brown brands, almost looks as they've been burnt in slightly. Um, and actually, um, this is, is a, it's the scale of the butterfly wings. Um, these ones are only on the males. Um, the, the, the long name, which is a, a, a bit of a mouthful, it, which is androconial scales, um, actually secrete pheromones that help attract the females. So um, some butterflies look slightly different whether you're looking at a male or a female. And the gatekeeper is one of those. It has this brown brand uh, and it's actually um, secreting pheromones to attract uh, female butterflies. It's a small to medium butterfly. And this one overwinters as a larva, so as a caterpillar. Uh, and the adults are on the wing, mostly sort of mid summer time, July, August. Um, the adults are feeding on wild species like marjoram, flea bay, ragworts, which does get a bad press sometimes, um, but great for lots and lots of insects and bramble as well. And we've moved away from the three butterflies or the butterfly family that use common nettle a lot for their larval food plant. Now, and now we're looking at some of the brown species where their larval food plant is actually grasses. So in this instance, um, families of grass like the bents, fescues and the meadow grasses. And so if you remember when I started the, the presentation and talked about it's about the life cycle, and as I said, it's not all about the showy flowering species for butterflies. Um, sometimes it's about the grasses as well. So it's really important, and when we're managing wildflower meadows or you're managing any habitat, to, fire, to provide a range of different vegetation, uh, including grasses. Uh, and these grasses are the finer grasses that you will find in good quality grassland. So really important for the gatekeeper. 
Now, another brown species that um, if we get a half decent day, um, hopefully you might spot out and about at the moment, the meadow brown. I always think of this one as quite a raggedy, palish brown butterfly. It is very variable, so sometimes you'll catch that orange on the upper wing. Sometimes it'll look mostly brown. If it settles long enough, you might get to see the single white dot on the upper wing. It's a medium sized butterfly, so a bit bigger than a gatekeeper. Um, perhaps yeah, possibly even bigger than a small tortoise shell, shell as well. Um, but it's this kind of pale, dusky brown colour. Um, this one again overwinters as a larva or a caterpillar, this time at the base of the clump of grass. Um, so again, having that kind of rough, tussocky, slightly messy grassland habitat um, is a, a much overlooked but very important habitat um, for conservation, and, and in particular, this the meadow brown caterpillar. Adults are on the wing in the summer and into the kind of I guess, early autumn, September. It's most abundant in grassland habitats. So if you're out in a field, meadow, park, um, anywhere where there's a decent amount of grass, um, and you'll often see almost clouds of meadow brown if it's a good quality habitat. And like the gatekeeper, um, the larval food plant, so where it lays its eggs and where the caterpillars will develop are grasses, the vents, the fescues, and the meadow grasses on the whole. So that's the meadow brown. And then uh, another one in the sort of the, the brownish um, family, um, the brown colour, and this is the speckled wood. And this is a slightly darker brown, and it has these cream spots, cream blotches. It's a small to medium kind of butterfly. Um, it has a, a strategy where it can overwinter as a larva and a pupa, um, which could be helpful for it. Um, they might be in slightly different places, um, so it might maximise their chance of actually surviving the winter uh, and emerging in the spring. So therefore there's a mixed emergence uh, and they're on the wing April to September. Sometimes there could be two or three generations um, in a year. The speckled wood, as its name suggests, is quite a, I think it's a woodland butterfly, but you'll see it in gardens and hedgerows. Um, it's, it likes dappled sunlight. So it's one of those where if I'm wandering along and, I'm like, and maybe wandering along a woodland ride uh, and there's a bit of dappled sunlight coming through and I see this sort of little brown fluttery butterfly and I think to myself, I think that's going to be a speckled wood. Uh, and if it rests long enough, sure enough, it often turns out to be speckled wood. Adults actually feed on aphid honeydew. So this is actually, uh, they're not nectaring on flowers, um, but they're actually taking the sweet sort of honeydew secretion from aphids um, as their kind of source, their food source, um, whilst they're flying around trying to mate and lay their eggs. Now the larval food plant for speckled wood is grasses again, so a bit like the last two browns that we talked about, uh, but this time there can be some of the coarser grasses, more widespread, Coxfoot's quite a uh, coarse, widespread grass, but really important, uh, the brilliantly named Yorkshire fog, that's the one that if you see a whole load of um, kind of really misty grey purple flower heads of grasses waving, um, that's Yorkshire fog. Uh, common cooch, uh, maybe the bane of many gardeners, they don't seem to like it, um, but speckled wood does, uh, and false brown as well. So they have a range of grasses um, that they will lay eggs on and that the caterpillars will feed on. So that one's speckled wood. Um, speckled, dappled, if you think about that, that's a good way to kind of remember the name of speckled wood. Another brown butterfly, um, and this one could be mistaken for the speckled wood, um, but it's more of a sooty or a chocolatey brown. When I see this one, I often think it's a darker butterfly. Um, it is a woodland ride kind of butterfly in glades, damp grassland as well, so if you're in a bit of a wetter environment, you might see a wing in it. It's got this lovely delicate white fringe to the wings uh, and small rings, these sort of paler circled rings with the black and then the white in the centre. Can vary to be more of a teardrop shape, um, but mostly these rings are, are, are usually fairly, um, fairly obvious if you can get it to settle long enough. And you'll see them on the upper and if it's resting with its wings closed, you'll see it on the under wings as well. Um, it has this characteristic bobbing flight, um, kind of June to August. Um, I always think of it as perhaps one of the later emerging butterflies and it's worth noting that this will vary depending on where you are in the country but I've always thought oh when summer's getting on a little bit um, you start to see ringlets appearing. Um, the thing about a ringlet is actually um, because it is sort of darker brown colour um, it's thought that actually this helps it to warm up um, better and actually um, absorb more energy for, even on a relatively cool day 
that actually if you spot a butterfly out and about on a cool day, a brown one, it could be a ringlet um, because it's slightly darker and better able to warm itself uh, and just like, get the muscles ready for flight that's needed. Um, so yes, I said widespread wood and white rides and glades, damp grassland, um, bramble and wild privet, um, you might see it on um, coming down to nectar. And again, the larval food plant, like the other browns, um, grasses, again, the coarser grasses, coxfoot, false brome, tufted hair grass, common cooch, and the meadow grasses. So quite a, a broad range of grasses, um, but it's a lovely, delicate um, butterfly, and um, one that you may well see around and about at the moment. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about blue butterflies, um, but really just focus on holly blue as, as, the, as the one to have a look at. Um, in this session. I'm sure we will go into more detail uh, in future sessions about the range of blue butterflies. It can be quite tricky to identify, um, but this is one that certainly will be on a half decent day out and about at the moment. And the holly blue is, uh, a, I think it's a, just a beautiful, really delicate pale blue butterfly. And the general impression um, of the holly blue is definitely blue. Uh, it may sound a bit daft, um, but some of the other blue species have got quite a lot of browns or oranges to them. Um, but the holly blue is pale blue underneath uh, with these dark um, kind of black dots uh, and that's a real indicator that it's a holly blue. It's a really quite a small butterfly. Um, it emerges early before other species, so again it's one of those quite early ones you see these little tiny um, um, pale blue um, butterfly flittering around. Um, you don't necessarily need to get too close to think to yourself, no that's a holly blue. Um, it's likely to be in your garden, um, parks, um, just pretty widespread uh, and it's flying quite high up as its name suggests um, it does like holly so in holly being a more bushy shrubby species and the butterfly will often be flying up more at head sort of height up and around in the shrubs whereas some of our other butterflies who um, are more associated with grasses will be lower down. So um, the holly blue is, is very well named in that it does use holly um, for its spring generation so the first generation of, of, of the holly blue will develop on holly, but then in the um, kind of summer generation, they'll actually use ivy. Um, so I might say <laughs> it ought to be called the holly and ivy blue, um, but I always think about the, uh, the Christmas carol, holly and the ivy, when I'm thinking about the holly blue. And something that um, I didn't find out for a very long time, the picture on the right of the um, screen here is actually the, the flowers of ivy. Uh, and it took me a long time to realise that ivy as a plant is more than just the sort of arrow shaped leaves that you see climbing around walls and fences uh, and in hedgerows. Um, but this kind of cluster of black, um, kind of black fruits um, is actually the ivy flower. Um, it's a late flowering species, so it's a really important late nectar source. Um, another reason to not cut your hedgerows um, all at once uh, and not cut them before kind of more like um, February time. Um, so that over winter there is this extra source of fruiting and, and potentially nectaring late in the season um, for a range of species, not just butterflies. Um, but that was just a little side note about ivy that I thought uh, might be of interest. So adults, um, like with the speckled wood, um, will feed on honeydew. Um, but they will visit bramble, holly, forget-me-not, kind of your garden type plants. Um, I've talked about the two generations um, and just to prove it is out and about at the moment, this is a photo of a very obliging holly blue that I took on my lunchtime walk last week, um, just along our local canal. Uh, and this holly blue is beautifully backlit, just sitting there, nectaring on the bramble, um, which uh, is still, still got some late flowers going on, although the, the fruits are very rapidly developing. Um, a beautiful little holly blue. And so yeah, they're out and about at the moment. So hopefully, um, I know we're fairly late on in the summer, um, but you will still be able to spot some butterflies uh, and make use of any newly learned skills from today um, when you're out and about having a walk over the next few weeks. So moving on from uh, blue butterfly um, to this, this striking um, yellowy green butterfly or the brimstone. I always think of it as the bringer of spring um, it is one of the first ones that I often see. It's most common out in, in spring uh, and I can always, it always makes me feel um, happy when I see the first brimstone of the year. It makes me feel like spring has properly sprung and um, we've maybe, maybe made it through the winter. So the female and male are slightly different colours. The female is a pale green sort of white butterfly. Um, the male has a really bright yellow upper with a more yellowy green under. Um, it's got a kind of leaf shape 
um, to the wing. So they're not quite so rounded as some of the butterflies. It's this really quite distinctive leaf shape. Um, and some might think um, uh, that the story goes that this butter coloured fly uh, is potentially the origin of the word butterfly. Um, so this is the brimstone butterfly. It's quite large. Um, it is year round, it overwinters an adult, and, you know, it gets a, gets a good head start, uh, most common in the spring, as I said. Um, you'll see it in most places, um, but its larval food plant is buckthorn and alder buckthorn, which are quite shrubby species, uh, not necessarily hugely widespread, probably hiding away in hedgerows uh, and scrub. Um, so again, harping back to what I said at the start, it's important to have this range. It's not all about flowers, but it's about grasses and hedgerows. And there are some butterflies that spend most of their lives in the top of the tree canopies. I'm not going to talk about the hair streak butterflies today. Um, but there are a lot of those and purple emperors, um, some of the real kind of real speciality species that will spend a lot of their time up in the tree canopy, hardly ever coming down. Um, so trees, hedgerows, grasses and flowers we need to provide a range of habitat for all these species. Um, but this one, if you see a bright yellow butterfly, chances are you've got a brimstone. And then the last species I've sort of grouped together, the three of them, um, are the whites. Um, this is just three of the whites, there are, uh, there are a few more, um, but these are the most common ones you're likely to see uh, in this area. You might know them as cabbage, cabbage white butterflies. I grew, when I grew up, I was always spotting cabbage white butterflies uh, and probably didn't really grasp at the time that there were several white butterflies that um, all largely feed on the cabbage family of plants. Uh, and this might be cultivated cabbages, so the ones that you'll actually, you know, um, maybe farmers won't be so happy to have, uh, have cabbage white butterflies because they will attack their crops. Um, but in the garden, you'll find um, cabbages or crucifers, or brassicas, um, all kind of similar names for this species, this group of species of plants. Um, often um, they'll have four petals. So if you're not sure, if you look at a plant that's got um, four petals in a cross shape, that's why they're known as crucifers. Um, that's the cabbage family, uh, and the cabbage family is really important for white butterflies. So the small white um, is, is a brilliant white butterfly. It's got little black tips on its wings. Uh, underwings are quite plain and creamy. Had two to three broods, all of the white butterflies actually try and sneak in that third brood. Um, the small white overwinters are pupa. Um, you might find it in your garden or down the allotment. Uh, and it's larval food plants are more um, wild or garden cabbages. So something like a garlic mustard or some of your garden cabbages. Now the large white is a bit larger than the small white, which does help. Um, but when they're fluttering around, it's actually quite difficult. Unless you've got both species side by side, it's often quite tricky to tell. Uh, and the main difference um, is not really to do with the spots, but it's to do with the black tip on the wing. And hopefully you can see the middle photo um, has on the large white, I've circled those two, um, points where the black tip extends round the end of the wing uh, and down a little bit, whereas on the small white it's just very much just black on the end of the wing. So if you do get the chance um, to spot one of the whites that eventually settles, um, you'll see these extended black tips on the large white. Also has creamy kind of underwings, um, two to three broods like small white. Again, gardens and allotments um, and out in the wider countryside, it likes cultivated cabbages uh, and obviously rape as well. So perhaps one that the farmers um, trying to produce a crop wouldn't necessarily welcome. And then the third of the whites that I wanted to talk about today is the green veined white. Uh, and this is size wise, it's sort of in between the other two. Um, but the real key distinctive feature about the green veined white is if you get it at rest long enough, as hopefully you can see on the underwing, um, you have these darker green veins. Um, it's just quite obvious. Um, it's around a similar sort of time, maybe slightly later emerging. Um, and you might find it in more damp areas where the vegetation is lush, in hedgerows, ditches, kind of damp meadows. Uh, and this white is very dependent on wild crucifers, so wild cabbage family, garlic mustard, cuckoo flower. Um, so that's that really delicate pale purple flower um, that you might see in a damp meadow quite early in the spring. Uh, or something like hedge mustard, um, which is quite a spindly plant with um, yellow uh, petals. Um, very much got the four petals uh, in a cross shape. So the three whites, small, large and green veined, can be very, very tricky. Uh, and even somebody who's quite experienced, when you're out, you only get a fleeting glance of, at them. Um, it might be quite tricky, so you might need some patience. Um, they may come back to the same plant, they may flutter off and come back again. So sometimes, if you get the chance, 
uh, and there's a patch of butterfly of white butterflies flittering around if you're able to just sit take a moment maybe with a pair of binoculars um, you can get some quite close focusing binoculars which is really helpful for butterflies I often find so whereas your yeah, binoculars for birding might give you a really high magnification so you're trying to spot birds a long way away if you look out for a pair that's quite close focusing that can help if you're trying to um, come up with something that's a bit closer um, but uh, it's just not quite close enough for you to see with the naked eye without it flitting off um, uh, and disappearing off um, out the way before you've had a chance. So small white, large white, green veined white. Um, something that I came across quite recently that I did want to just finish on uh, in terms of talking about the white butterflies is actually um, scientists have been studying um, white butterflies uh, and been able to apply um, what they've learned from butterflies into solar energy, would you believe? So a lot of the white butterflies, and actually you can see it on the left-hand side here, the small white, um, the way they rest their wings at this sort of outside angle enables them to almost harness the solar energy um, into the body uh, and make their wings, uh, uh, make their muscles much kind of more prepared to fly. Um, so it helps them to warm up, helps them to harness the power of the sun. And scientists are actually using this in the design of solar panels. Um, so it's just it's absolutely fascinating. I won't go into the detail, um, but if you're interested, do look it up. There's a whole study um, that uh, the scientists have been I say, using the, the angle that the butterfly rests its wings and the scale of the butterfly's wings and actually being able to use that um, to improve the design of a renewable energy source. So um, fascinating um, and a little bit off topic um, in terms of identification, um, but uh, hopefully a little bit interesting nonetheless. So I just wanted to talk to you before we move into our question session um, about um, some resources that are available. Um, so as before, um, we have a spotter sheet uh, available via the website and I will email the link out to everybody afterwards. Um, so this has um, the butterflies that I've gone through today um, with a few little ID tips uh, and a space to record when you've seen, where you've seen them and perhaps a reminder to take a photograph. Um, this is all sort of preparing you for the idea of, of taking further the identification and turning it into a recording session. Um, as I mentioned at the start, we are going to be developing um, the kind of the skills that we're learning over the next uh, few months and, and years. Um, and with butterflies, hopefully we'll be um, building up to um, those that are interested, um, being able to actually take part in one of the formal butterfly monitoring schemes. Um, and we can target that in certain areas within the Charmer Forest. Uh, and it's something that you do frequently, um, but it's really good to get into the habit of um, thinking, right, I need to think about what date I'm seeing these things, where am I seeing these things, and potentially taking a photograph, um, which really helps with identification if you're unsure, uh, unsure um, if you can manage to take a snap of a butterfly before it flitters off. Um, it's a really good way to come back and say, right, it was, was it that butterfly um, or not? Uh, and you can come back and, and then compare it with one of the great um, kind of books, uh, butterfly identification books. Um, but one of the things you might want to take with you if you're out and about is the Field Studies chart, uh, Field Studies Council chart on butterflies. Um, it's a little A5 fold out laminated um, sheet that's got all of them on and size guides, uh, little notes about the habitat. Um, it's just a handy little reference that will give you a, a few hints and tips. Um, not as detailed as a full book, but it's a lot more uh, lightweight if you're just going to pop it in your rucksack when you're out and about. Do visit any of the other websites um, that are on the list there. So Nature Spot is Leicestershire and Rutland specific, um, so it will give you a good hint as to if the butterfly you think you've seen um, is something that is has been spotted in the county um, and is kind of a, a regular. Um, some of the rarities um, you might find in the books um, are more restricted to southern Britain. So you might think, oh, which blue was it or what butterfly was that I spotted? Uh, and if it's on nature spot as something that has been spotted in, in Leicestershire and Rutland, um, then you might be onto the right, uh, the right thing. If it's a rarity and you know, they're saying, no, it's, it's never really been recorded here, either you've got a great record and hopefully if you've managed to get a photograph, um, we can verify that. Um, but it may also give you a hint as to, well, if you weren't sure between the two, um, it's probably more likely to be the one that is common to the county rather than the one that uh, hasn't been seen in the county. There's a British Butterfly Identification page on the Wildlife Trust's website. 
uh, and butterfly conservation, as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, uh, has got some really great links, loads of information, and it's got those timing charts so you can sort of see when you might expect to see the adults, uh, when the eggs are laid, how it overwinters. And um, so there's some really great uh, information on there. So uh, we're going to move to the question and answer session now. Um, just before we do, I'm just going to show you my final slide, which is a reminder um, for the next session um, to book ahead. Um, Wednesday the 15th of September at one o'clock again on Zoom, uh, introduction to insects um, with um, our Species Monitoring and Recording Officer Tim Sexton. Um, she'll be pleased to hear that um, I'll be bringing in somebody else, so you won't they will just be listening to me um, an hour, hour a month, every month. Um, Tim's going to be talking about insects in Charnwood Forest uh, and in Heathland Habitats, so do look out for that one. But for now, I'm going to stop screen sharing uh, and we can see if there are any particular questions and answers. Uh, and I can hopefully see if there's anybody back with us. Let me just see if I can find the chat box. Um, so at the moment, um, Edward, please can you send me a link to the past two sections? Missed the link to the previous session email. Absolutely. Um, I'll be sending around an email um, to everybody who's on today um, who can uh, so you'll have all the links uh, and the, the web page, um, the Leicester Children and Wildlife Trust Child Forest web page has the previous recording links on it and it has the link to the uh, Landscape Partnership Scheme introduction from Julie. Uh, it has the spotter sheets on it and it also will, um, as, we, as we start to set them up, it will have the links to each of the next sessions going through. Um, so, um, if you're all still with me, is there anybody who might like to um, raise a hand, jump in with a question, or pop it in the chat box? Just going to see if I can look across the across the screen. We've got a couple of screens worth of people. Anybody who might have any questions? Dick. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, in uh, the spring, if I'm cleaning out my garage, I often find probably peacock butterflies that have hibernated. Now, uh, you know, you might be dusting off the cobwebs or something. Should you put them back on the shelf? Should I put them in the garden? I really don't know what to do with them. Sometimes they open the wing and, you know, are they still hibernating? Or what's, what's the guidance when we come across a hibernated butterfly in maybe the garden shed or the garage? That's a great question, Dick. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think the advice would be to try and let it settle back where it was. Um, I think if you took it outside and the weather took a turn for the worse again, uh, it might run the risk of being overexposed when it wasn't quite ready to come out. Um, if it found its way in through a little nook or cranny in the, in the, in the, in the shed or in the garage, um, it will be able to find its way out again when it's ready. So if you can, try and leave it undisturbed but if you have disturbed it um, just pop it back where it was just out of the way somewhere but hopefully where you're not going to knock it or tread on it um, and then if, if once it's woken up like most species it might decide it's going to um, kind of wake up uh, and go outside but hopefully um, if the weather's not good um, just leaving it to rest back in and it might settle down again. Right, thank you. Okay. Can't see anybody else waving at the moment. Uh, all right. Um, uh, so Rob says, I'm involved in the butterfly transect at Stony Well. This year, the sightings have been very poor. This is generally a trend throughout the Charmed Forest area. Um, I don't know the answer to that actually, Rob, yet. Um, I think it's difficult with, um, with kind of trends to know until we've got the full seasons worth of information in um, and, um, so I haven't heard specifically one way or the other. Um, hopefully, once we get all the, the information in um, and, and everybody's submitted their, their records, um, we will get a better picture. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the Stonywell um, site particularly um, to know whether that's a uh, very whether there's lots of habitat specialists or generalists. Um, I know some years um, specialists do better or worse depending on kind of how the weather's been. It's been a, a bit of a strange year with a very hot spell. Um, relatively early spring um, and then at the moment obviously things have gone a bit chilly and a bit and a bit um, a bit breezy which is not necessarily brilliant so um, the short answer is I'm not I'm not entirely sure um, but hopefully once everybody sent their records in and um, we'll get a better picture of, of what's been going on this year. 
And Simon has asked, how variable is the length of the caterpillar stage? Gosh, um, off the top of my head, <laughs> um, it does very much depend on the species. Um, and as I said, the caterpillar stage will go through various stages. And I understand that sometimes those stages will change in terms of how long or short they are, depending on the, the weather. Um, one of the potential impacts of climate change is some butterfly species might be almost tricked into thinking they've got time to uh, get in another brood before the winter. Um, but if that um, brood hasn't had enough time to develop to an appropriate stage to overwinter successfully, it may not successfully overwinter. Or if it is not um, developed enough overwintering, um, then it will be set back a bit um, when it starts the next year, may not be as robust. Um, so how variable is the length of the caterpillar stage? That it is variable uh, and it will depend on the species, it will depend on the habitat and the climate as well. You pop back a screen, see if anybody else is waving at me. I can't see anything. Um, so we're a few minutes to two o'clock, um, but hopefully you've enjoyed it. Thank you once again for mm -hmm. joining us. Um, if any questions occur to you afterwards, do please feel free to get in touch. If you email the info at email address at uh, the Wildlife Trust, so at info at lrwt.org.uk, they will forward it to me. Or if you receive my email, um, feel free to just ping an email back to me uh, and I will do my best to answer any questions that I can. Um, so this is still the early stages of the project. Um, we are developing, um, hopefully, over the next few years. Uh, I'd like to kind of find out as we go through what people would like to see uh, going forward. We've got some plans for the next few sessions. Um, so we'll take it from there. Uh, hopefully people keep enjoying it. Do feel free to just you know, keep dropping in, share the link afterwards so that other people can pick this up if they would like, uh, if they can't make it today. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to end the meeting. Um, have a great rest of the day. Uh, and I hope to see you again at some point soon. Thanks very much, everybody. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.